every lead in the world sucks. And it only is based off of how good you are. Mm. That's the only answer. Every lead is a lead, but it's not a sale. And we, we're, we try to eliminate any kind of apprehension or roadblocks so that when I get on, when I start pitching this customer, I feel a certain way about that lead. That was the big thing. The biggest thing I took away from Grant Cardone's two-day mastermind. In the first hour, he spent the first hour talking about an ideal life. We understood very quickly because our family came from the restaurant business that we did not want to be the owner operators. We did not want to be have our income solely based on our efforts. We wanted to be able to skip out on a Friday, come hang out with our friends, and still have a business that was generating money for us. So for but for an independent agent who wants to sell over the phone, that's certainly doable and feasible, but you gotta follow a system. And it's not leads. I love it you say that because people are always like, dude, why, why do you need to go outside the industry? Or why are you having these out these these external industry guys speaking at 8% and that kind of stuff? It's like because Because we're tired of hearing people talking about recruiting and recruiting yeah. and recruiting and yeah. layer after layer after layer and then not releasing agents and then ripping them off and selling them crappy leads. And 92% felling. And but that's been the industry for decades. And yeah. no one has said enough is enough. That's right. No one's broken that cycle. You are listening to the 8% Nation podcast, created to help you become a top producer in the insurance industry. Enjoy the show. All right, welcome to this week's episode of 8% Nation podcast. We have very special guests, Cody. We have friends. We do, dude. Jonathan and Ramiz Hakeem. You guys are celebrities. <laughs> oh we my. are so honored, honored to have you guys join us. We're so, honored to be here. Thanks so, for having us. Thank you guys. How'd you get so famous? We started following Cody Askins. <laughs> yeah, right. There we, go. there we go. No, we're just excited to get you guys, you know, hear stories, just talk through, keep it kind of casual, um, but just kind of really just kind of tell some stories, you know, because you guys are considered in the industry, we hear it all the time, the leaders in the final expense telesales industry. Oh, geez. The OGs. The gangsters. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Thank so you. So why don't, why don't, you know, Ramiz, we've had you on the podcast. You told a little bit of your story, but now that we have both you guys, why don't you guys just kind of, you know, tell us a little bit about how it all started. I know you guys are a family operation and, you know, now that you both, we got both brothers here, we're missing Tony, unfortunately, he was going to come down, but couldn't, but what's that story? Is there any, is there any interesting sort of, you know, stories that we didn't get on the first time now that Jonathan's here, we can kind of talk through or? Well, Tony didn't come because now you have to invite us back again to have all three of us. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then the fourth time, Aaron, it's like, we just got to keep, <laughs> yeah. you know, adding someone. Yeah. There it's takeaway selling there 101. Um, but we started, I mean, geez, when I was in, uh, this would have been in 05. Jonathan, you were in what grade in 2005? Uh, probably fifth grade. 10, yeah. You'd been like 10 years old. That's, that's okay, yeah. Grade, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's Jeez. crazy. So, You're like 25, yeah, right? Yeah, so I'm in, yeah. I just turned 26 last month. Getting old. So Catching yeah. me. I know, man. It feels weird to say now I'm 26. It used to be I'm only 21. Now when I'm like, I'm only 26, nobody responds weird anymore. So I'm like, got to stop saying that now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, I was in college and got in the, I needed to make some money, got in the insurance business. Long story short, I ended up hiring my mom to set appointments. Jonathan at that time, so this would have been in probably 07 or 08, so he was just at the end of middle school, middle school getting into high school. And I'm like, dude, I need another telemarketer. But we didn't have any money to pay a telemarketer. So Jonathan, <laughs> I think it, nowadays it's probably illegal to do this. Um, <laughs> we bought a Cricket wireless phone, had Jonathan sitting outside because there was no reception in the actual office. And... Uh, if I tell the story, they're not going to believe yeah, me. I was going to ask me. I want to hear from your side. <laughs> they're not going to believe I well, tell yeah. the whole story. Well, the first thing is, I just want to just say, first off, this room that we're in doing this actual podcast was bigger than the entire office that we were in. Okay, <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> so that's the first thing. So it was, it was, it started off with me sitting in the hallway because there was no room inside the building. Um, but like Ramis said, you know, back then we didn't really know anything, so we bought like ten cricket cell phones with with all different phone numbers because we didn't know anything about getting an office phone number, but using cricket, you know, it's like, I don't know, 25 bucks a month, all you can use, all you can text everything. And, uh, yeah. so we used to just telemarket off of these 10 cricket phones. And because it was cricket back then, they didn't have no service. I, I don't know if they have service now, but, uh, so we used to just sit outside and we'd have to just hand dial these phone numbers and like, we would like have a Nokia phone. It was it was like a Kyo, Kyo what is it the it starts with a K the Kyocentra is that what it is it's like one lower than Nokia yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. but uh but yeah man it was uh it was a grind that's but that's that's literally how everything got started but he would sit in one of those old lawn chairs you know like those old lawn chairs that like have like that rubber straw yeah so by the end of the day <laughs> it would stretch out so far he'd be like sitting on the ground. <laughs> 
<laughs> and oh uh, my gosh. so we've come a long way since then, to say the least. But, well, so did he come to you and say, "Hey, I need you to do this," and you said, "Okay, sure." Or how did that dynamic happen? You know, like that seems yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I mean, you know, we always grew up in a family business, right? So it was just it was just always one of those things. Like if somebody needs help, like right now, if, we could be in the middle of Thanksgiving, and one of our family members be like, "Hey, the re- there's we need help at the restaurant," and half the family drops what they're doing in the middle of Thanksgiving to go work at somebody's restaurant. So when in our family, everybody being in in the family business it's very normal to be like hey i need help and you just you don't even expect anything you just help because that's just a part of being in the family you know yeah so it's pretty yeah so and how old were you when you made your first dial or is that is that something we don't want to talk about that's all right right, right, right. (laughs) yeah all right uh but yeah it it was it was before high school i don't know 12 13 seriously yeah Yeah. so and you're setting appointments basically yeah for People always ask, how'd you guys get so good at it? It's because we've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> it has nothing to do with skill. <laughs> we've just failed over and over again until we got good. You there know? we go. There we go. That is really interesting. So you know, you basically started, what was the next evolution? So did you hire people at that point or were you just pounding the phones and just kind of, you were the only telemarketer? How did you get to where you guys, like what was this? We, we see you now and we see you in an office of this. But so, what were some of those stories along the way? Well, you, your mom told a bunch of stories at, at Burt's Lodge that you may or may not want to share, but those were, we'll have to get her on at some point. Those were hilarious. <laughs> I don't remember. There's so, so many of them. I mean, they're really, they're, there was a time yeah. where I couldn't afford, we couldn't afford payroll. So we had to, I had to give my brother, Tony, my black grand am. I'm like, dude, I can't pay you, but here's a black grand am. Here's a car. Uh, that, that happened before. Seriously. Uh, oh yeah. There's a story, you know, when we, John, Jonathan makes fun of this room and how big it is compared to our first office. Well, our upgrade was then to a trailer. Okay. And, um, and it was, it was across the street from, uh, like four or five strip clubs in Dayton, Ohio. So it was really easy to recruit people. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't the best part of town to say the least. Yeah. Um, and in the wintertime it would get so cold that we complained to the landlord, like, hey, man, we got to get something going on here. This place is freezing. There, there was an actual hole in the floor of the of the bathroom. It was just a single bathroom. So you could see, like, the dirt on the ground. And we complained and said, hey, we need some we need some help here. Like, Because yeah. he had one of those uh, latches over the heating thing, you know, so you, we couldn't change it. You'd have to, have to break it or whatever. Mm. So, he, so, on a, so, he, so Monday morning we come to work, and he's like, oh, Hakeem family. I got you all taken care of. We, I fixed everything. You are good to go. So we, we walked in and he had literally like, not even like the legit plastic for the windows, but like saran wrap. He had saran wrapped the windows. Um, and then we went to the bathroom. He had put saran wrap over this hole, uh, to try to clog all of these, uh, (laughs) the drafts, the drafts and stuff. Yeah. And so I, I guess, you know, I think the story really is, like we just never really gave up. We didn't have a choice to give up, honestly, yeah. dude. Like we rolled our whole life on this deal, yeah. and um, every time we just got we fell down, we just picked each other back up and made it work Car- over and over again. Cardone says, "If you if if you don't, what does he say? If you don't quit, you can't fail." Yeah. Exactly. Sounds yeah. like that's and that's really it too. I mean, because like, kind of like the joke I said earlier, when you've done it as long as we have, it's like there's so many opportunities to quit, and most people unfortunately just give up. Most it, people don't, mm, don't. It would have been way easier to give up. Yeah. It because you know. It just would have been way easier to give up. Yeah. Uh, we, we we have really, uh, I guess because we're stubborn. We're, I mean, we are a stubborn family. Y'all, y'all have been around us outside of here. We, we argue and poke at each other and, you know, but um, but I think that's what kept us going is that we're just like, mm-hmm. we're not going to give up. Like, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Well, I, I think even bigger than that, I think it's harder to give up when it's like the whole family is working with each <laughs> yeah, other. Like, yeah. It's like, I can't quit because everybody, my whole family is depending on me. Like, it's like, yeah. not like I just, I'm on my own and I can just yeah. go quit and get a job. It's like, if I quit, like this thing shuts down and then now it's not just me yeah. going to find a job. It's four other family members who are dedicating their life to this. So it was, it was really just, there was just so much on the line, you That's know? That's a good point. So, but Yeah. It, that it started off that simple, but looking at this room is really funny. This like, room is bigger than our first office. It was probably this half the like size of this. 150 square feet, probably. Yeah, and there know. was, I think, eight or nine people in this room Yeah, marketing. People used to call in on one of these cricket phones and be like, hey, I need to order more leads. Or usually it was, I need to cancel leads. Uh, but uh, we'd be like, let me let me just put you on hold. And then we would just like pass a cell phone over the yeah. cubicle and be transfer, like, hey, we would so, transfer somebody's you, on the phone for you. Let me transfer you over to somebody, and then we would pass yeah. the cricket wire. Pass the actual cell yeah. phone. And people yeah. thought we were a really big company, so we used to have like four different identities. Like, let me get you on the phone with Tom. And then we just like, change our voice you know <laughs> and then people be like let me let me come visit your office and, and be like well our, our office is under construction i'll meet you at the panera bread 
We were under construction for like four years. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's holes. They were getting fixed with ceramic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So did that happen to y'all too? Because we literally just had someone from Rogersville, Missouri, an agent from Rogersville down the street, like show up and ask for one of our salespeople just like last week when I was gone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course it did happen. Yeah. I mean, no yeah. doubt about it. And it was, you know, it, it was it was very humbling because, you know, we were trying to make stuff happen and um, some of them want to come visit the office and it was like, gosh, we don't want them to come to this office. <laughs> yeah. This is not what we're trying to do, you know. And then mm. we, we finally got into a nice office. Um, actually, it, was, it reminds me a lot of this office. Um, a lot of good office space, nice, clean, and um, but it wasn't a call center space. And yeah. So from there, we mo- we actually moved from Ohio out to St. Louis specifically for the call center that we're at right now. Yep, yep. So Jonathan, what's your role um, with North Star now? Do you mind talking about that a little bit? We first heard from Ramiz. So you know, what are you doing on the team now? <laughs> That's a tough question, man. I we always make the joke. I've done so. I've done so many things that at this point I'm like the maintenance man. So whenever there's a problem, somebody just calls me, and I'm just I'm just the go-to guy to to fix everything. So okay, I'm uh, so that that's I guess the best way to describe it. Well, so, what, what yeah. you you were a tele, I mean you were a telemarketer, but then you were leading the marketing team, right? But you then evolved from that. Yeah. So I mean, going going way back, you know, it started off as telemarketer, and then it went to customer service, and then we really from there built customer service. Um, and we hired a woman named Pam, who is now our director of customer service now. And then as we promoted her in, I became director of marketing. And you guys have both met Chris. He's, mm-hmm. uh, he worked under me for, for a few years, and now he's taken over uh, all of marketing. And, and then now I'm just kind of finding my way of what, what's the next thing for Good. Jonathan, what's the next thing for North Star. Uh, me and you do a lot, of, a lot of work together. Yep. Me and you, Landon, probably talk more than me and Ramiz, and we're in the oh, same sure. building. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So I, you know, it's just whatever it is. You know, usually, usually a lot of training with managers and and how to better train employees and better train agents and how to be a better mentor to your team and uh, and how to just groom people in the in our company. One one of the things that I get a lot of uh, questions on with with FE Telesales specifically that you guys have been able to master, and and I know that this is one of your guys' secret sauces, but you guys have been able to, you know, bring data and leads into openers and then openers into transfers. Do you have any wisdom for people that are trying to build like an opening opener department or build openers? You guys have really mastered that, and a lot of our clients they can't figure it out. That is like a stopgap for a lot of people. They can't figure it out. What have you guys learned that's allowed you to build that team and consistently be able to deliver those transfers? I'm glad you asked that. We have a webinar series that's only nine. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I actually do tonight, but this won't be out tonight. But We probably have two different, to, two totally different answers. So do you want to answer first or you want me to answer first? Go ahead. Okay, I'll answer first. Uh, every lead in the world sucks, and it only is based off of how good you are. Mm. That's the only answer. So Make sure we get that on recording and we put that out there for the rest of the world to see. Yeah. And, and, to, and to his point. And, and this Maybe is we have the same answer. Well, and to his point. Um it is it is extremely difficult not to prejudge a lead. It's mm. just it just is. I mean, I, I, any manager that tells you don't prejudge a lead, don't prejudge a lead, don't prejudge a lead, I'm telling you that manager tried really really hard not to prejudge that lead. Yeah, it's just impossible not yeah. to. So when you have those openers, what you're doing is you're manufacturing the same quality lead regardless of the interest level of the client. Yeah, and so whether it is a cold call or a digital marketing lead, or a television lead, when you have that buffer and that filter, everything is delivered to the agent, much like a product that you would buy from the store. Like if you like a certain kind of deodorant, when you buy that deodorant, you expect it to be the same way every single time. So that, that buffer in there delivers the same quality, the same product every single time. So I do agree with Jonathan. I mean, every lead is a lead, but it's not a sale. Yeah, And we, we, we try to, for our own sake and for our agent's sake, eliminate any kind of apprehension or roadblocks so that when I get on, when I start pitching this customer, I feel a certain way about that lead. I agree. That's yeah, awesome. And really to add to that, the numbers really don't lie. And what we've really found is when you know, we don't write any type of guaranteed issue or anything like that. So we're really only writing, you know, full level comp immediate coverage policies for the most part. So when you wean out all the people who most agents write that they really don't get paid on and you're only looking at healthy people, whether it's a TV lead, Facebook, cold calling, the ratios really aren't that far off from each other, which really proves the fact that it really is just based off of how good you are. Our number one agent, Ernice, was also the number one agent for Pioneer American when we used to use avatar leads 
when we first 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 got started when they before that was even illegal she was a number one agent back then now we do facebook leads she's still the number one agent now she's gotten better so her sales have got gone up mm -hmm. but the leads really haven't changed it's really been the same script you know when we use youtube or we use tv leads our, our sales don't drastically go up it's just it, it, it's just all based off of how good is that agent and I, I, I think that I credit a lot of our success to you. That's how we train our agents to be. And, um, but the other aspect of it too is efficiency, you know? So, so there's the prejudging aspect of it, but then there is the, let me keep dialing on these leads so I can get somebody on the hook and then begin to reel them in. We just, we just see that as something that's very simply like a minimum wage our employees job yeah. and yeah. they need to deliver those clients to you as opposed to you trying to go out and go hunting for those clients yeah. mm. yeah. wasting a bunch of time weeding through you know what i'm yeah. saying yeah. i mean you 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 we, we know the numbers i mean yeah. our average person in our pre-qualifying department not including inbound calls is making two to three hundred dials would you say some more yeah. a day yeah you know and um their average transfer is about two to two and a half Per hour, so in an eight-hour shift, they're transferring over twenty people. Incredible. So now, if you're yeah. if you are an agent, one of those transfers is going to be um, you now starting a pitch, right? So if it's if it if if it takes you thirty minutes to find one person interested, then you have to pitch that person. Mm -hmm. So you're in an hour, an hour and a half, and a third of that time you were doing really low-level activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so we, uh, that's the other aspect of that is, okay, now I'm delivering a good lead, but I'm also optimizing my, my day and my time by only talking to people that want to talk to me, you know? Absolutely. That's good. That's so good. I, I love, I love mentioning that, that every lead sucks, you know? It's true. Dude, I mean, I, I don't know how. And there's no such thing as an exclusive lead either, you know? Every, I cannot tell you, in our database right now, we literally have millions upon millions of contacts many of which are duplicates, even the freshest of leads, when we call on them, we got people that call our television commercial and ask for a specific insurance company. Hey, are you, hey, I'm trying to cancel my thing. Well, ma'am, this is not so-and-so's company. You're, you're, you're calling in to obtain more life insurance. Yeah. Like it's, it's a very saturated market mm -hmm. and people are filling out the same ads over and over. They're filling out the same direct mail cards over and over again. They're calling it to multiple commercials. And so, it ain't the leads, man. Like that's not what's yeah. going to separate you from the competition. It, yeah. It's you and it's your system. Mm. Another thing to add to that too, a, a, a big reason of the success too is most insurance agents, unfortunately, are very, very, very lazy. Yeah. And when it goes to that prejudging, they don't. They just want to make the excuse of why they couldn't close the sale. So a big part of our success too is when we have an hourly employee calling a lot of this outbound data. It's like do whatever you can to send this lead over to a salesperson or you're going to lose your job. Yeah. So when you have that kind of pressure on yourself, yeah. they're forcing themselves to pitch every single person until it becomes normal. Cause obviously that's not a normal thing to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that's a, a big reason why our agents are successful at North Star. Cause a lot of them started off in that same position where most people who get into sales never really get put in that situation. And they really don't know how to pitch people. Like, like Remiss said, when somebody calls me, and says, hey, I want to cancel my insurance. I'm with blah, blah, blah. Right. My answer is, oh my gosh, I'll help you with that. But let me tell you what I can get you qualified for. And I'm pitching now this person my product. That's exactly And then right. after I sell them, I'm going to cancel their insurance for them or help them go through that process, you know? Where most people are like, oh my God, this lead sucks. She called me to cancel insurance. Yeah. That's great. She now needs insurance. She's canceling her insurance. Exactly. Perfect. I wish I can get a lead like that all day. But most people look at it the exact opposite. Mm. You know? And I don't know if I would That's necessarily powerful. call that lazy. Uh, that was the adjective Jonathan used. I, I just don't. I just think there's not a, a lot of people that have seen success modeled for them. Well, like that, just, you're they, probably right. They, you're probably right. They, Thank you, Jonathan. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, 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 he's right. It's not. It. It's not that they're not. It's they not just that don't. They lazy. don't know what to do. Because yeah. I'll tell yeah. you. I, I mean, I'll be honest okay. with you. Okay. There are there are people who are like they're really successful employees, and then they, and then they make the the jump and become. A salesperson and then they fail over and over again but they were really successful at one point in their life so it's not a I don't think it's effort necessarily or will or could be skill but that's not why people fail I just don't think they know what to do especially in the telesales realm we get bombarded with people that want to learn what we're doing and it's like okay it works because we have a system yeah and we're not changing the system every day let's try this lead let's try that lead let's do this let's do that like for an agent that becomes it's just diff it's just very volatile, yeah. but you got to find a system, follow the system, and then 
just duplicate that system over and over and over again. Mm. Well, in, in, in you say that, and most people do want to learn telesales. Like mm-hmm. deep down, everybody would love to sell in their underwear from home. Sure. You know, uh, not everybody would like to see everybody sell from home in their underwear, <laughs> but they would like to do that. But at the same time, they won't spend the years or the money or the time or the energy doing what y'all did over the last however long, you know, a couple decades or whatever, you know. They just won't. Well, I mean, we, we, we went in there with a much different mission. We, we, we understood very quickly because our family came from the restaurant business that we did not want to be the owner operators. We did not want to be have our income solely based on our efforts. We wanted to be able to skip out on a Friday, come hang out with our friends, and still have a business that was generating money for us. And so we went in with a much different mindset. So for, for, for an independent agent who wants to sell over the phone, that's certainly doable and feasible. But you got to follow a system, yeah. and it's not leads. It's really yeah. not. It's not the leads. It's not the the company that you're selling for. It's not uh, who's training you, which that's part of it. It really is. What system are you following, and then how do you fine tune that? You fine tune that with training. You fine tune that with leads. You fine tune that with pr- processes. But you got to find that system, and then plug in and keep working it. Mm. Did you guys create your own system? From the start, or did you guys sort of a, a, you know find one that you partner with somebody and then sort of make it your own, or did you just create it from scratch? Definitely, I mean, we, we definitely created it, but we went. Listen, man, when we grew when we grew up in 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 Ohio, there's there are these places called chili restaurants. We don't have them in Missouri, okay? But like chili, so like in Cincinnati, there's Cincinnati style chili. There's two big franchises there: Skyline Chili and Gold Star Chili. Our entire family is in the Gold Star Chili business. So we grew up like we grew up in the back of the restaurant, okay? Like we would wake up super early in the morning. My, our mom would take us, put us in the back. They would go uh, start prepping and everything like that. When it was time for school, she'd take us to school. When school was over, we'd go back to the restaurant until, until the evening. If you go to a, uh, some ethnic restaurants, many times you'll see their children sitting at yeah. the table there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, That's how we grew up. We didn't want to grow up. like We didn't want that for our children or for ourselves. And so we knew very, very quickly we have to scale this and get people to fill our seats and begin to put together a process that just spit out money for us at the end. So we went in with a much different mindset than how can I sell over the phone? Yeah, right. It, it was more like, okay, how do I get a thousand people to sell over the phone? Yeah, I, I love that you thought bigger. You wanted something that, as uh, Matt Monero talks about, what does he talk about? The uh, mule manager and magician. You yeah. Know? Who wouldn't want to be the magician with, with a business that you've worked on for years that spits out money. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, in the most most people will never say that. They're like, "Well, no, I just want to, you know, independently go sell forever." Mm-hmm. They may say that, but n- n- everyone doesn't really actually want that. Sure. Well, that's definitely an easier way of doing it. I mean, we would have saved that's a right. lot of heartache and pain and and disappointment over the years if we just did it on like if we were still selling final expense over the phone. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, for some people like if you know, if we if 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 I'm 65 years old and I'm retired, I'm not trying to build a business. I just want to enjoy where yeah. I am right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for others, and we were we had an advantage. I mean, we were young. We could take a lot more risk. We didn't have kids. We weren't married. We could yep. do a lot of dumb things and not get in trouble for it, you know? Yep. Um, so it was just perfect timing for us at that time. But we also had the privilege of being raised by entrepreneurs who we saw break their back to make mm. ends meet. And we were like, that ain't that ain't just that ain't gonna be us. Yep. When, when did it click? When did you see like because you guys are projecting thirty four million in premium this year, correct? Mm-hmm. When did it click for you that this could be a reality? Like, there had to have been a moment in time where it clicked, where you're like, holy crap, we got something good here. We we might have different answers, but uh, I was gonna say, I, I me and Landon laugh about this all the time because I feel like Landon's like my my like cheerleader he's like always pumping me up <laughs> yes. but i feel like it still has a click like i feel like we still have so much to do like 34 million for most people is like oh my, I, I don't know what you're gonna say but i feel like for most people like 34 million there's no way like, sounds that's, impossible it sounds impo- like like i'm thinking it, well you know what i'll tell you when it changed actually for me was when we when i went to the first growth con uh it was, there was multiple speakers saying like oh you think you're a big deal because you sell a million dollars oh you think you're a big deal because you sell 10 million dollars how do you get to 100 million Mm. And I was like, man, we're so far from that. Like, that is crazy. Like, I've been thinking we're a big deal because people tell us we're a big deal. Yeah. But, man, there's so much more to do. So so for me, if it doesn't feel like it's still clicked. 
Mm. It feels like it in instances because people want to talk to me. People like Landon tell me how, how many people ask about us. Um, yeah. I just went to GrowthCon and, and, and Landon knows some of the connections that I make because we're doing some work together. But even people that I, I'm looking up to are coming to me saying, hey, how could you in, how could you help out my team? I know we don't do interest, but what could you do for me? Yeah. And um, it feels weird because I'm like in my mind, I'm like, dude, there's still so much more for me to do. But um, but it, so it doesn't feel like it's clicked, but but it, it's just, I don't know. What do you think? Every it? person that like thinks like that or, or, or there's a, every successful person I've ever met thinks like that. It's a, it's a competitive edge. Yeah. You know, it's just a competitive edge. And the moment that you're challenged, it just, it clicks again for you. Right. So I would say there's multiple clicks that take place to get to a certain level and at, for one click, it, you get a good sprint out of it. And then you kind of think, okay, I think I got this. And then another click happens. You know, I think about the first sale we did over the phone. I'm like, oh my gosh, if we can do this once, we can do this a million times. Mm-hmm. Then I think about how marketing changed. I think about the first time we generated a Facebook lead. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, if someone would fill this out on Facebook, we could do a, a billion of these. Yep. You know, yep. I think about the first time we did a voice signature. I'm like, dude, we're going to be unstoppable. Like, so there's just a lot of gears that turn that begin to create this big machine and then and then you start gaining momentum then you're unstoppable like why would you stop at 34 million yep. like right. why would you stop at well you told million? me the other day when we were walking through the office i'm like dude how big could this thing be you're like i think there's like 500 million available yeah. you know and i'm like dang i freaking love that when well, you said that i'm like dude and, and the same thing happened for me at growth con two years ago i thought i was hot stuff man and i left thinking that's why I love events and that's why I love, you know, that's oh, yeah. why we're doing 8% and everything else. But I'm like, man, I am so freaking tiny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, so much of it really does come from though education. And when I say education, I'm not talking about going to school to learn geography or history. Okay. Um, you know, attending things like 10 X, reading books, yeah. listening to podcasts, paying for people's knowledge is a, is a big part of it. Okay. I, I expand on that for a quick second. Cause, cause I've seen y'all do it. Y'all have seen me do it recently. Uh, I've gotten to where I almost spend too much wanting to know more. And I don't know that there is, that that is actually a thing too much, Mm -hmm. but for, you know, for the amount of money I make and the amount of money I spend, some people would say that's too much, but I, I just like you guys, I, I I know there's more available and I want to get there as fast as possible. I think it's only too much if you're paying for things that you're not using. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you're, if you're paying for 10 courses and you're getting, Great information from all 10. Now, 10 courses may be too much. I don't know. Yeah. Depends, I guess, on, on who you are as a person. For me, I sure. I struggle with focusing on stuff anyways. But, I mean, I'm a, I'm a part of multiple coaching programs right now where I'm getting little things here and there, you know, on a weekly call with, with multiple people, you know. And uh, it, it's it's so important to be able to, to get those nuggets and learn those things because you are really paying for someone's knowledge. I can either learn yeah. by failing and having to learn from my own experience or... Or I could just pay, mm-hmm. you know, you just did that. You'd probably spend a bunch of money to sit, sit down with Grant Cardone. Something clicked with me there, too. We talk about yeah. clicks. I'm sitting in the event. No, I'm sitting in lunch, and Cardone's on stage in the Diamond Lounge, and he's like, hey, you know, we're doing this $50,000 two-day mastermind, and I'm going to give everything away, all the secrets. The team's going to be there. There's only going to be like 15, 20 people in the room. And I'm going to be like, I'm like, I'm sitting there, and I, I look at my wife, and I'm like, I'm mad at myself that I don't feel like I'm ready to do that yet. I'm like, it, it, it kind of ticked me off, mm-hmm. you know? And she's like, we'll figure it out. So I did it. And it yeah. was and like, I can't, like all the stuff I learned that I've already shared and that we like keep, you know, it's like, it's incredible. You yeah. Know? Well, it's exposure is what it is. You just get exposed to a different frequency of thinking. Yeah. And a lot of people just don't think... It, I mean, everything is a cycle. There's a cycle of poverty. There's a cycle of abuse. There's a cycle of, mm-hmm. of success. I mean, look at how many professional athletes have children who are professional athletes. Yes. I mean, it's just exposure. And so you, if you're not where you want to be, you got to break that cycle. Mm. That's, that, that's, that's the only way that this works. And so if you're looking in the insurance business for someone who's going to break the cycle, it ain't going to happen. It's just not. There's nobody... There's nobody leading the way. I mean, you guys are, you guys are, I believe, one of the pioneers in getting people to think differently. But you got to look outside 
of of this little tiny industry. I love the, I love as you say that because people are always like, dude, why, why do you need to go outside the <clears> industry, or why are you having these out these these external industry guys speaking at eight percent and that kind of stuff? It's like because because we're tired of hearing people talking about recruiting and recruiting yeah. and recruiting and yeah. layer after layer after layer, and then not releasing agents and then ripping them off and selling them crappy leads and ninety two percent felling. And but that's been the industry for decades, and yeah. no one has said enough is enough. That's right. No one's broken that cycle. It's when people left the industry and said, look how the mortgage industry is doing things. Look how the car industry is doing things. Like, why not take the good from other places and infuse them into a multiple billion dollar industry? That's right. Then when, we, then when you do that, now all of a sudden things happen. Mm-hmm. Look at the industry now. It's much different today than it was five years ago and totally different than 10 years ago. Yeah. Totally different. Because people are thinking different. It's not the same old guys that have been in this thing for 50 years telling us the same thing over and over again. Everyone wants to hold on to all these little secrets and they think they know everything. You know, like when I, when I started doing Facebook leads several years ago, people were literally, I would have people emailing me, please stop telling people what you're doing. <laughs> I believe it. Because we're using it also. It's working well and we don't want anybody else to know. Sure. And I'm like, that just sounds so small minded. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And now there's, you know, 4,200 oh Facebook lead vendors. But it's like, dude, who, you know, who cares, right? It's just, it's, I love that you're saying that. It's true. Wow. It's good. I'm blown away. Yeah. I mean, so you guys both read 10X. Yeah. So what was the biggest thing you took away from 10X, Jonathan? That connections. You don't, well, you know what? Don't judge a book by its cover. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. But, uh, but you just never know who you're meeting and what they can do for you. Um, and I, I just met some people who, who, if any of us would have met some of these people, we would have been like, I'm not going to really spend much time talking to this person. They're, they're a, not really a, a big deal, and you just, you just don't know. And it's happened to me numerous times in my life. But, but at 10x specifically, there was some, some deals that I was able to, to accomplish, some, some sales that I was able to close. That if I was in public, I would have looked at this person and been like, ah, I'm not going to talk to that person. That person's just seems kind of weird or they seem sketchy or they don't seem successful in there. I'm like, wow, this person really is legit. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, that, that was my biggest takeaway. It wasn't something that actually happened in the conference, but it was something that happened f- from other people who, who attended the conference. But it was just crazy, man. I mean, Floyd Maywe- Mayweather was there and they asked him what's his most expensive watch. And he said $18 million. They said, well, why would you spend $18 million on a watch? He said, well, when you got this much money, who cares? Yeah. You know, and then John Travolta owns three planes. He said, well, why do you own three planes? He said, because if one breaks, I got another plane for backup. Like, this dude owns three planes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... Uh, it just thinks so different, man. It's freaking <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. So uh, so the two things I would say is definitely don't don't ever judge a book by its cover because mm. I think Grant Cardone says this, but he always says, you know, who got my money? Other people really do have what you want. Not in the sense that you're trying to take what they have, but other people are going to get you to where you need to be. And uh, so don't ever judge somebody because some people who you don't think are successful are probably way more successful than you. Wow. And then the second thing is, is don't just don't think small. You know, Cody, yeah. you spent $50,000 to sit with Grant Cardone. Probably the best thing you ever did. Yeah, it was. I, I left now and I'm like, I can't imagine not doing that. Like, I would be so upset. And yeah, I made a huge mistake while I was at 10X because you text me one night. You're like, hey, I'm, I'm here with like some Dude. ex-GrowthCon speakers and we're all like <laughs> hanging out. And, and I didn't go. And that was a mistake. Dude, you should have came. You I should've totally came. should have. The, the later that night, I looked at Lauren. There's these moments in life, and I'm like, <laughs> Lauren, right now, I made a huge mistake. I should have went and freaking hung out with Jonathan and, and Tim Story and Carrie Kasem and all these other people. Like, her person that owns LA Style Magazine, like, et cetera. It was like, it was crazy. And yeah. I'm like, dang it. That was a mistake. And you know what's wild about it is uh, it's, it's Chris, who is in charge of marketing now, just had his 30th birthday that same weekend as, as 10X. Yeah. And we didn't party and we didn't drink and we didn't do anything. And he looked at me and we got back to the room. He's like, dude, this is the best birthday I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, but I think a lot of people make that mistake. I struggle. I don't know if I've ever said this. I struggle mostly with knowing I should do something or knowing that. TikTok is going to be big, but being stubborn about stuff, you know, for a random weird example. If I struggle with that, I know a lot of other people do too. And that's why it's like, okay, just write the check. Just go, you know, show up and network. And I still struggle with, with you know, actually taking action and doing stuff. And most people wouldn't think that, but I really do. Well, and the comfortable thing is to sit in your bubble because you're the king of your bubble. 
know what I'm saying? Sure. Like you can sit there and I can be yeah. the king and I can do my thing, but it's only whenever I get around people like you guys and just that and partner with Cody and all these monsters where I'm like, oh my gosh, like it's just a different wavelength that we're operating on. Getting out of that comfort zone is huge, obviously. You know? Dude, they drop some bombs at 10x too because you're yeah. the, the that's a huge takeaway. You said don't judge a book by its cover. I heard countless times I'm not going to 10x because the speaker lineup. It doesn't yeah. look like what I want to do. And there's never been a conference in the history of the world <laughs> that dropped that many celebrities and powerful people and speakers in the three-day span. Yeah, It's never happened. Yeah. Dana White was, was probably one of my favorites. I don't know about who, who your favorite was. Scooter Braun surprised me, Scooter, but Dana Scooter White was, was cool. I didn't realize two, they bought it for two million bucks and sold it for four billion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. I thought that story was so phenomenal about how – he convinced the Fertitta brothers to partner up and buy it. And then yeah. out of them just believing in Dana White, they were like, hey, we're just going to give you 10% of this company. Like, we just believe in you. You yes. put no money up, but we're just going to give you 10% of this company. They turn around and sell it for $4.5 billion, which is to, if anybody watches the TV show, um, it was Entourage. The, you know, Ari Gold, who's the agent, who's crazy. and yes. So that guy in real life bought the UFC for $4.5 billion. And the story was he literally put everything on the line. Like they said, he liquidated everything that he had. Everybody thought he was nuts. Everybody was like, "Dude, you're an idiot." It's four point five billion. It's not going to get any bigger. It's the UFC. Like it's not even a, like it's not basketball or the NFL. You yeah. know what are you doing? And he literally sold. They said everything, everything that this man had, bought it for four point five billion dollars. And they said today it's worth uh, nine, just over nine billion dollars. And that's like in just like four or five years. Yeah, and for <laughs> someone know? like Dana White to not put any money up and go from. No investment to four hundred. He was a bellboy. Yeah, he was a bellboy at a hotel when they bought the UFC. I think that's the biggest takeaway from. I think out of all the conferences I've been to, I remember Ed Milet saying one time, "This would have been this was the ten uh, x before this last one." Yeah, he says, um, "People don't have to believe what you're saying; they have to believe that you believe what you're saying." Mm. Yeah, and I think of stories like that. You know. With Dana White, like I'm not sure if, if if they believed him, but they surely believed that he believed what he was saying. Yep. And you, when you look at things like that in life, I, even even this presidential, this last presidential election, um, where Hillary was was going up against Donald Trump, no one believed what Donald Trump was saying. Like no nobody did, but everyone believed that he believed what he was saying. Yeah. And they didn't believe that about Hillary. They're like, well, we know she's lying. Even the people that liked her were like, I don't know, she may be, you know. But but that's a, that's the biggest takeaway. That's good. I think that's good in sales too. Is like you have to have such a deep conviction that even if people are apprehensive, they're like, but dang, that dude really believes it. Like, let's just let's just do a deal. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, but that stuff just comes. From, that's the only nugget I took away from 10x2. Wow. Um, I took a lot, but that was the, that was the one that like has really stuck with me. Ed Milet saying that that's powerful. It, it, it changed it changed my entire perspective. So I don't know what we spent. I mean, with airfare, hotel, and the ticket, maybe it was five to seven because I didn't get a really good ticket like Cody does. Um, I think I spent like that, but that was worth way more than seven thousand oh, yeah, dollars just for, for sure. that conference. You know what I'm saying? We talk about uh, well, Jordan Belfort obviously speaking at eight percent, and he talks about certainty all the time, and I totally agree with that. Like. If you are more certain about the ability that whatever product or service is going to do than the other person is that it's not going to, they're probably going to do it. <laughs> well, and, well, isn't that what sales is? Just a transfer of conviction? That's a it. A transfer of beliefs? Like you didn't know you wanted this before you talked to me. Now I have to transfer my conviction into you and now you want to do business with me. That's exactly right. So. That's exactly right. Man. Goodness gracious. You got any other questions while we... Dude, uh, all I do, I'm like, this is, I just had like a little moment um, internally listening to you speak. I'm like, okay. I remember four years ago watching videos on YouTube of you giving a tour, maybe it was Tony, giving a tour of North Star. Oh, yeah. The previous space before you you know, sure. bought an additional 100,000 square feet or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm watching the, the, the what I thought was big at the time that's now small. And I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm like, man, it'd, it would be incredible to, to meet those guys. You know, to, to, to get to go tour that place, you know, and have people like that as a part of my network, you know. Sure. Um, and then we've got a, um, a big carrier. I don't know if it's okay to say or not, but a huge carrier coming in today. Um, the largest privately held insurance company in the world. They're, they're coming here today as well while you guys are here. Um, and I just, I, I am thinking back over the last four years. And it's like 
everything I've done is is worth it. And you know, um, you guys are talking about going from you know thirty four to five, half, half a billion. It's like, dude, people need just to, just to start. Like that was a big thing. The biggest thing I took away from Grant Cardone's two day mastermind in the first hour, he spent the first hour talking about an ideal life mm-hmm. and how years ago he crafted what he viewed as his ideal life, and his ideal life. Did in, involved flying around the world on a jet. Mm-hmm. His ideal life involved having twenty billion dollars worth of real estate one day. His ideal life did not involve getting his own coffee. You know, his ideal life involved having a, a massive conference and a massive team. And he's just like everyone needs to figure out what their ideal life looks like, yeah. dude. And I think a big thing for you is your ideal lo- life looks like a, a final expense telesales company that is that is bigger than anything else everybody's ever seen, probably doing hundreds of millions a year. And, you know, you're able to, as Monero says, eventually be the magician, you know, yeah. like everybody has this, I, like I know for him, his ideal life is for, you know, security marketing be doing a hundred million one day. And dude, I believe it's going to happen. You know, uh, I just know that everyone needs to be thinking about, okay, what does my life look like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? If you're Jonathan, 40 years, you know, cause you're freaking young <laughs> yeah. and I'm getting jealous. I'm t- almost 30, you know, I'm like, dang, uh, I think everybody needs to start thinking not what I want my exit to be, but what I want my ideal life to be. And then, and then, and then begin to formulate a a um, a path to that. Yes. Like not a business strategy, but like a life strategy. You yes. know, I, that's that's what we did. I mean, we really knew what did we want our life to look like in ten years. Like, mm-hmm. and that's what we went in. And we're not even at the ten year mark yet, but we're <laughs> like everything that we do is all geared towards. This is what I promised. This is what I promised my wife. Like this is what I promised it was going to look like. Yeah. So every decision that we make, we're going to point it towards that thing right there. Mm. Which, which if you talk about successful people, very few of them talk about money. Like they just understand that money is the byproduct of that. That's right. But this, I want the biggest conference, not the most profitable conference, but yes. the biggest conference. And I want this and that. And then the money is just a byproduct of what I want that to look like in the future. Yeah, that book I put up on uh, Facebook that I was reading on the way to Vegas, uh, on the way to 10X, it was about... Uh, there's no plan B for your A game, I think mm-hmm. is what it's called. Mm-hmm. And he talks about how everyone needs to make a decision to be the best in the world at something. Yeah. And I remember as a kid watching my grandfather preach. Uh, he passed away last year. He preached for a Baptist pastor for like 40 some years. And as a kid, I grew, well, we all have these moments in life. And I grew up thinking, I want to travel the world and speak. You know, uh, I want to be a speaker. And I think that was one of those moments that click, you know, mm-hmm. sitting at 10X, I'm like, I want 10,000 people in the audience at an insurance conference one day. And I think everyone's had those moments in life where something's clicked for them or they wanted something. I think the biggest difference is some people decide to execute and implement and, and really go for it like, you know, like you are and like you guys mm-hmm. are. I, I stole something from you, Ramiz. You told me at a conference one time, I'm not sure where we were hanging out, but we were talking about the definition definition of success. And you said your definition of success is the ability to do whatever you want, whenever you want, without any hesitation, mm-hmm. um, because that means you're in a place where you've got things on cruise control. And to me, it, you know, that is that is where I, that's my definition of success. That's my ideal life. I want a successful company. I want people that can count on me. I want an organization that that supports uh, our team. But I really, at the end of the day, I want to be able to go on a trip. I want to be able to go into a business venture with somebody that I don't have to think about what I have to give up to do that. If I want to go, if, if you and I want to go start something, I want to go do it. You know what I mean? And I, I love that definition, man. I adopted that as myself. I'm sure. Where did you get that from? Well, uh, you know, because so many people would go to the money so fast, yeah. but then you look at all these people in Hollywood that have all the money in the world and their life is just trash. Yeah. I'm like, is that what success looks like? Mm. Like that's, that's not what I'm, that's, that's not what I want. No. Like forget the money. I just don't want to be like that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And not to be judgmental, but like you just see all these crazy stories and, and people dying so early because they just, they try to mask this success because it's so painful to them. Yeah. And um, so I just knew just very, I just, I don't know, just, I just, I've always thought, I just want to be able to make choices that I want to make and have enough confidence and belief in myself that if someone judges me, it's not going to bother me. And that if um, I wanted to do something, I don't have to second guess my decision. Yeah. And so... Again, I, I'm not totally there yet, okay? I'm, I'm just not totally there yet uh, because um, there are things I'd like to do but I'm just apprehensive about. But the decisions that I make today are pointing to that definition of success. Well, it's, it's hard to... It's, it's, it's 
crazy to hear that you're as is is massive as you guys are and is in the amazing things you're doing that you're still apprehensive about doing something. You know what I mean? That like that has to like resonate with people listening right now because I would never think you're apprehensive about anything. Um, and I don't so, know what, what what exactly we're referring to, but well, you see what I, I mean. I mean, I I, work, I live in a very very small town with three thousand people. Uh, nobody knows really what I do for a living, and um, and my wife and I are very active in the community, very mm-hmm. very active. So uh, because of that, we are very apprehensive. We're very, very uh, conscious of the image that we put out. We just, you know, we don't drive the cars that we'd like to drive. We don't live in the house we'd like to live in because we are afraid that that's going to get people to look at us differently. Yeah. And, that's a, and, and that's a shame that we feel. But, and I don't think anybody would. It's just this own internal turmoil of, you know, let's just stick with the Ford. Let's just, you know, let, or, or, or park that car in the garage, you know. Um, and so that's not success. You either got to get out of that city or I got to just tell people, whatever, get over it. But we're just not there yet for whatever reason. We well, also were talking about your plane. You know, that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons you want your plane is because I want to be able to get my, my sons are growing up and I want to be able to make their basketball game. If I don't have a plane, there's going to be games I'm going to miss. Yeah. You know, so some people look at that as materialistic. The three planes is materialistic. Well, John Travolta has three planes because he doesn't want to miss something. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? It's not about the three planes. Yeah. And he never talked about money. He never brought up money one time. And uh, but I think uh, it's material. It's materialistic because people don't have that kind of money, right? Like like Floyd Mayweather owns an eighteen million dollar watch. Well, he's worth billions. Like what him spending eighteen million on a watch is like. I mean, spend one hundred eighty dollars on a watch. It, it, you, know? you know, maybe not you, but maybe a normal person, right? Yeah. Like like so, is it materialistic that he bought an eighteen million dollar watch? You know, I, I mean, I, I see why people say that, but they're looking at it from their standpoint. An eighteen million dollar watch is definitely materialistic. <laughs> I'll just be honest about that. No, you know? I mean, for, but for all we know, maybe he's donating $100 million to charity every year. Is it, yeah. is, is it still material? Like, you can point? justify, pl- like, I can see justifications for other things. But. It goes up in value. So it's an investment. It's like buying us $18 million worth of stocks. Oh, now the brotherhood's coming out. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Cla- <laughs> Clash of the Hakeems. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, my, my, my thing is, you know, Ramiz brought up his definition of, of success. And my whole thing is, I want to be able to own my time. And I want to be able to not have to think twice about anything that I want to do. Yeah. If if I want to go spend a hundred grand to spend a weekend with Grant Cardone, well, let me give you two hundred grand, so I'm the only one there. Yeah, you know, how, 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 I don't want to have to think about things. I don't want to have to. Now, obviously, I'm going to think things through. Like, is that worth the money? Or, or not? I'm sorry, not is that worth the money? It, it, am I going to get value from it? But I don't want to ever sit in a position of can I afford that? Mm-hmm. Is it going to is it going to be worth my money? Should I should I buy that or should I invest in? Like, if I want to go buy a Range Rover or or Lamborghini or a Ferrari, let me do it without having to think about it. Yeah, yeah. and and that's my definition of of success is just the freedom, the freedom to do whatever you want to do on your time, on your own money, and not ever have to ask, I guess. Mm. I, I think that, Ramiz, you mentioned too, um, I feel like one of my things that are like holding me back, and, and I think we've had a similar mindset in this, is like worry about what, and maybe you're better at this than me, worry about what people think. You know, like I want, Cardone would absolutely totally disagree with this. I think every successful person would. Um, he thinks half the world should absolutely hate his freaking guts, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I want people to like me, you know, and, and I think it's maybe cause I'm 29 and, and I'm just starting all this, but that's a, it's probably a problem. It's probably well, a liability. You were, you were raised in a Christian household. Yeah. Okay. You're not a Scientologist. And so, that's true. um, <laughs> I, I just be honest with you. And so there you're, you're, you're serving a much greater cause mm-hmm. than just let me inspire people to make money. You know, you're really yeah. trying to model what does a wholesome lifestyle look like? That's not everybody's definition of success, right. you know. Scratch and crawl and step on people's throats to get to the top. You couldn't pay me enough to do that. No, you know what I mean. Or to lie about somebody or make someone look bad so that I can prop myself up. There are people that will probably tell you that that stuff's okay. Yeah. And it, it, my family's just not. And I know your family's like not like that. Maybe Lane's family, but we're uh, rough. We're, we come from a rough <laughs> <just> area. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but that's the um, that. That's the difference, I think. That's the difference, I think. Like, I care what people think about me because I care about them. Yeah, yeah. You know, not that I care that they think about me, you know? That's that's really good. I can't roll up to the food pantry in my Range Rover. 
it just it's just not the right image. Mm. I'm here to take, bring my kids to serve people that are underprivileged. I like that you still think like that too. Man. You know, and, and I don't Powerful. think that's gonna. And so Powerful. so then there's that there's that internal tension of okay, well, are you successful then if you're worried about what people think about I, you? I disagree with you though. I think you can inspire a homeless person because you drove a Range Rover to the food pantry. <laughs> And so Jonathan's definition is much different than mine, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I think everybody, I think everybody's entitled to their to their own opinion. But I personally don't care about what people think of me. I, I hope people. That think is of true me. about Jonathan. Jonathan legitimately does not care what people think about him at all. I love that. Yeah, and, and that doesn't make him any less, any better, or, or worse than than any one of us or anyone in our yeah. family. But out of all of us, my sister, my brother, uh, my parents, Jonathan could care two craps about what anyone thinks about him. Well, uh, it only goes into just because people's opinions don't hold value to me. Now, I want people to like me, obviously, like it'd be nice. But I also know to go to the same thing you said, if half the world hates me, mm. does that because I help the other half? You know, does the other half hate me because I, I, I'm i helping the people that they want to put down? I mean, who knows? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. You know, so people are going to hate you no matter what you do. Yeah, because I mean, we'll get you will get 50 YouTube comments a day and, and one will be like, oh, I love this dude. The next one will be like, dude, this dude's a scam and I hate this dude. And I'm like. Yeah. Hey, what did I do just, to make him yeah. say that? Yeah. You know? Well, they're just jealous. Yeah. They're just jealous. You know. If that's the case, I need more of that, I guess. But I, I think, dude, I think we're yeah, gentlemen. out of time. Thank you so much for hanging out. This has been incredible. I love just having the casual conversation with you guys. You guys have such such wisdom that comes out of you guys. So that was really what today's about. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks yeah. for having us. Yeah, we appreciate you guys. See you at eight so percent. Yeah, yes. see you at eight percent. Yeah. Give it a plug real quick. Why are you guys excited about eight percent? What's the one thing you can't wait for? Man, it, 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 you guys always do such a good job. I mean, the, from the Thanks, from buddy. the moment you step in to the final keynote, it's just always, always really. I'm bringing my wife this year with me because she wants to be part of it good. too. And so nice. it's just I can't even say one thing. It's just the whole experience. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like it out there. Yeah. I, the one thing that I, you, first of all, I'm I'm super excited because I know you've shared with me the speaker lineup. Yeah. And there's some really, really, really great speakers this year that most people don't know about. But the other thing that I, that I would to just say about it is first of all it's vegas mm. okay vegas and baby there's not very ex many excuses to have a tax write-off to go to vegas that's right so so if i could get the government to pay for me to go to vegas i'm going to be there I, I, you might even find me at like some carpentry uh expo next month because <laughs> i just write because. that off yeah that's i went right, i went right. there to learn sales okay yes. so so yes. that's what i'm excited about. i love vegas vegas is a great spot but that speaker lineup is is going to be so awesome i know that they're going to be able to deliver so much value to the industry that's good dude thanks all right man. well that's a wrap guys thank you so much thanks guys thanks Hey, if you love this podcast and you want to know how an agent went from homeless to six figures per month, then click on that video right there. You'll love it. And I'll see you there. I'm homeless. I have my wife and kids. I don't have any money. I don't have any money. He said, I won't work with you. Now, now mind you, I've watched this guy make millions of dollars in his lifetime. He's with different network marketing.